Welcome to another episode of Gear Talk, a Noria podcast, where we are connecting reliability professionals with reliable information. We have Dr. John Ross from Maintenance Innovators with us today, and we're going to talk about a topic that is maybe overlooked or not thought about in a lot of cases, which is what is the uh, role of the storeroom in reliability. Now, John, one of the, the core concepts here with this podcast is to getting to know the individual uh, a little bit because, yes, we're going to have reliable information, but that comes from reliability professionals such as yourself. So if you mind giving us you know, kind of a little bio, a little background about yourself. Yeah, sure. Wes, thank you. Before I actually get started, let me just congratulate you and Nori on this podcast effort. Everything you guys do is first class, and I'm excited to be part of your program. And uh, just well done. I, oh, I know it'll be you. very successful, and, you, and you'll get tremendously good information out to your viewership. So uh, thank you for putting this together and inviting me out here. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're, we're excited about it as well. Yeah. So I started out pretty much like anybody in Oklahoma with uh, going to Oklahoma State University. And I say there. that because there really was only the one choice. There we go. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to be uh, in the Air Force. I loved airplanes. I wanted to be an officer in the Air Force. I needed an ROTC program. So I went to Oklahoma State graduate and got commissioned, went to my first assignment, and I spent 11 years in the Air Force as an aircraft maintenance officer, flight line officer, always on the tip of the spear, if you will. Mm -hmm. I got out of the service uh, after 11 years and say 94, 95, and got to my, you know, got my first civilian job, and it was a little pots and pans manufacturing plant in Clinton, Illinois. And I was there um, for just a few days, and I realized very quickly I didn't know how to run a maintenance organization, even though in the Air Force I'd run one for 11 years. Turns out Captain Ross didn't run the maintenance organization. Sergeant Anderson did, okay. or Sergeant Kalinak, or Sergeant Schrock or somebody. It wasn't Captain Ross, right? And I felt like, holy cow, I really oversold my you know, qualifications. Not only did I not know how to run a maintenance organization, I really didn't even know how to start one. And this was a pretty sad maintenance organization. Good people, but the processes were not sure. There. I didn't know how to start one, so I got a flyer. This is way before computers. I got a flyer in the mail, you know, the old line card. Remember yeah. those? You know, is this you? No planning, scheduling, no storeroom, no preventive maintenance, no work order. We didn't even have a written work order system. This, you know, a little frowny face at the bottom. If this is you, call this number. And I called the number. The guy flew out and looked around and said, man, you guys suck, right? And I'm going to send a consultant down. So he, he sent a consultant down, a guy named Jack Burgess from Chicago. And Jack and I became very good friends. And Jack showed me. Not maintenance per se, turning wrenches and screwdrivers, but the 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 reliability side of it. How okay. you want to main. So he said, he said, John, assets come to us with what's called inherent reliability. The way it was designed, built, and installed that sure. adds up or multiplies up to like inherent. It never is better than that. Right. Our job in maintenance is not to fix stuff, but it's to maintain the inherent reliability. So if you design it greatly, you know, build it, you know, awesomely, and install it the best way in the world, you got a really reliable asset, but if you design it poorly, build it cheaply, install it hastily, you got a nightmare for 20 years. That's right. So we're trying to guard that inherent reliability, and everything you do in the maintenance organization is to preserve, guard the inherent reliability. Mm -hmm. And I never heard that. I mean, I was on aircraft weapon systems and never heard the reliability. It was just, hey, the plane's got to fly, get out there and fix it sort of thing. So that was really, you know, like a puppy with his eyes closed for two <laughs> weeks. You know, I, my eyes were closed for 11 years, and all of a sudden this was Just a opened up. Yeah. And uh, so that started a sort of a, a series of different jobs and stuff and uh, that I was working my way through. Getting, and I eventually I had to come back to Oklahoma. Parents were in poor health, so I came back to Oklahoma and was st still working in maintenance and reliability as a plant engineer at this point. And then uh, you mentioned you introduced me as a doctor. I wrote my dissertation on the, the lack of leadership training and development in the skilled trades. So what, what's okay. happening is... We have a lot of technical leaders, and some are actually running companies, own companies. Sure. But they don't have any leadership because the whole time we're training our maintenance people, if you will, to be great managers. They're mm -hmm. managing projects. They're managing budgets. They're our managing schedules. Assembly. They're managing processes. Mm -hmm. Nobody's leading in the technical fields, and so I think we're doing ourselves a great disservice. Anyway, so I wrote a dissertation on it for my Ph.D., Somebody said, "Won't you put your money where your mouth is?" And I said, "That's it. I quit. Started my own business." And this was—I just—it's uh, six to be sixteen years ago in October. Well, congrats. Yeah, th I still have the very first dollar I ever earned. I had my first client was down in Texas, and it's been a great experience. But uh, more than just being a student of this, which I am, I, I've just—you know—made a career out of just doing something about it. Yes. And so that brings me essentially from being a broken arrow high school graduate to where we are today. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, 
obviously you've got a vast experience in all aspects of maintenance and reliability. Today we are going to be talking about, you know, how does the storeroom right. actually play into your reliability strategy or your reliability program? Because, all right, let's talk about it from Noria's aspect. When we talk about lubricants, right, lubricants, we, we say it's kind of the holy trinity here, right? They need to be clean, cool, and dry. Well, that's from reception all the way through, you know, getting them to the machines. So the storeroom has a responsibility there if they are actually storing the lubricants. Storerooms may or may not be storing oils, but a lot of them store grease tubes. There's proper ways to do this. But let's extrapolate that out to components of assets, maybe spare equipment itself. I mean, where do you fall in this? Like, what what do you think the storeroom should be doing to help us in the field? Yeah, uh, Wes, not only do I spend a lot of time thinking and, and researching this, but I spend a lot of time actually making what I think storeroom's making them better. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to point out, and I think you personally know this, and many of the folks at Noria do know this, that I, I use you guys as, as an example in a lot of my a lot of my training that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, one of the, when I do an assessment of a maintenance organization, one of the areas I always go to is the lubrication storage. Mm -hmm. I think if anything gives you a telltale sign of what kind of maintenance discipline they have, it's lubrication storage. Sure. And I guess I would ask the listeners on this podcast to, to look at your storm lubrication, the storage rather, mm -hmm. give consideration. Does it look like you practice world-class lubrication? Yeah. There are seven types of preventive maintenance, and lubrication is one of those, sure. as is an inspection, as is in calibration, as is alignments. Lubrica so the most important thing maintenance does is preventive maintenance, and the most important type of maintenance we do is lubrication. If you only had one maintenance person, they'd be doing lubrication. Sure. So – Again, asking your listeners, look, consider your lubrication storage area and ask yourself, does it look like you know it's the most important thing you do? And yeah. if the answer is no, then now you've got an opportunity to do something great. I don't, I want a lubrication storage area that not only looks incredible, but performs at the same level that it sort of appears to mm -hmm. be. It looks like it's together, if you will. It's, you know, I, I say, you know, think about your lubrication room. It's not a cost center, but it's actually a profit center. I mean, because I mean, if you if you look at it that way, a lot of the reliability flows through it. But what about the the storeroom from other you know parts and pieces? You know, bearing storage, everything else. You know, because as you talked about that, you got into uh, kind of the weeds and you wanted to do something about it. And I know that you are doing stuff about you know storeroom as well. Yeah. So uh, when I teach uh, storeroom, or, or I'm working with clients to work on the storeroom. I said, look, the storeroom has. The goal of the storm are the deliverables, primarily a service and convenience. Look, if your storm's not providing service and convenience, you're better off not having a storeroom. Because if you didn't have one, you'd be really awesome at preventive maintenance and really great at planning and scheduling and be really good at ordering things in. But your storeroom has five primary goals, if you will. Okay. Right part, mm -hmm. right time, uh, right um, quantity. Okay. Those are the three that everybody does or mm -hmm. tries to do. But yeah, here's the, other, here's the other two that makes it reliability. Okay. Uh, in support of the maintenance budget, in support of the reliability effort. Okay. And here's what I find because I go to my clients and they hey, John, can you come in and help with the storm? Or, John, can you come help with just planning and scheduling or anything in maintenance? There is no reliability effort. It's maintenance, right? And think mm -hmm. about all the KPIs and metrics that most organizations track. They're all maintenance administration, you know, PM compliance, schedule compliance, CM from PM. The real reliability ones, and this is where the storm comes in, because one of the reliability metrics is mean time between failure. Mm -hmm. How long does that component last in service, right? Yes. And I can tell you, well, I don't even need to tell you, Wes, because you know this. If you have a motor, say a 10 horsepower, 20 horsepower motor in the storeroom, and it's there for a couple of years, right? It's in stock. Sure. And we desecrate that in storage, we're not going to put it yeah. in service and it's still going to have, uh, I'm just guessing there are 15,000 continuous duty hours on it because we've ruined some of that. Well, it's your, uh, what you talked about earlier, inherent reliability, right? Yeah. We yeah. did not guard that inherent reliability no, it, in the storeroom. In fact, it's my part of my store, it's part of the storeroom program is we're going to guard the inherent reliability of the component. And back in the old days when I had a 29 inch waist and hair on my head, <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, this was was not common like every day, but it wasn't so rare that you never heard of it. Uh, a component, we'd get it from the supplier, if you will, and or we'd get it out of the store and we'd put it in and it didn't last. And we everybody would say, well, it must be bad from the supplier. But I'm here to tell you right now, and this is, you know, from the 1980s and 90s to now, there's been such improvements in you know, total quality management, quality circles, Six Sigma, 
just specification tightness, all these things from the, the people that make these components. The odds of a young person today getting a bad part from the supplier is so remote. I, I would almost guarantee they never see it. Yeah, very and, rare. Yeah, what's probably happening is you're not, um, the, the, the way that you're storing it is causing the degradation, right? If you mm-hmm. put a vibration pen on a lot of our metal shelves in the storm, you'll see they're buzzing along at some harmonic. Sure. You know, electronics should be kept dry and cool. Not so much the cool part, but the dry part. We're trying to keep the humidity down. Uh, just generally the way that we store things, we're, we're, we're damaging them or taking some of that life off of them. And then you couple that with less than precision maintenance, installation, alignment, and torquing sure. and those kinds of things. It's no wonder that our motors that should have lasted 15,000 hours are only lasting 7,500. The trouble is we don't know that any of that had to do with any of that. We're just like, oh, it must have been bad from the supplier. Right. The blame game at that point. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I think I, I listened to one of your your papers that you presented. I can't remember which conference it was, but I, I laughed to myself because you said, you know, people can go out to the field and they say, this is the most critical asset we have. And I think you said, <laughs> yeah. envision a red carpet and there's incense burning. Prayer rug. Yeah, yeah. prayer rug. Animal all. sacrifice. But then you go into the, the, the spare of that that's in the storeroom and it's got a layer of dirt on top of sure. it and everything else. And I think that that's a, I mean, that's a good way to look at it as well. Is it's it's not only about you know yes, it's critical once it gets into the field, but you know what are the critical spares? How are they handled? Because I've seen yeah racks next to uh, rail spurs that are vibrating around, so the bearings are damaged as they they get in there. What I mean, if you had to summarize maybe some best practices for storeroom management, I mean, where do you tell people to start? Yeah, well, it, I uh, matter of fact, this is a recent conversation, but uh, so a lot of it boils down to how do we know what to stock and not stock? Mm-hmm. How, what do you know what to stock? And then the quantity of. Uh, so here's a couple of rules, if you will. Sure. Uh, I'd say sort of fundamental. You only stock parts for an asset that appear on that asset's bill of material. Okay. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense. Only the parts on that machine. And again, go back to inherent reliability. If I took a coupling off of a machine, it was, the coupling was bad. I took the coupling off. And I didn't have that exact same brand, make, and model. Mm-hmm. But I had something I could get my hands on real quick, and I put that on. It's quote-unquote close enough. Mm-hmm. I haven't accidentally increased the reliability of that asset. I probably chipped away at it. Mm-hmm. It's just like you guys see this at Nori. All, you must see it all the time. I didn't use the lubrication that it came with. I used something close. Yeah. I didn't grease it frequently enough like it was supposed to, but close enough. And, mm-hmm. and, and even then, the quantity was off. You didn't make yep. the reliability better. You chipped away at it pretty soon. Enough of these little chips and, you know, enough of those. And in about two or three years, the machine looks like it's 20 years old. And we're wondering, how the heck did that happen? Yeah. And so we we only stock what's on the bill of material. And just a rule of thumb, if people are wondering, well, okay, we can't stock all of that. No, no, you, you, do, you definitely don't want to stock everything on the bill of material. That's ridiculous, right? But it's only from the bill of material what you're going to stock. There you go. So you might take a look at, uh, you know, what is... Uh, uh, if you understand the life expectancy of the parts, you might stock them based on a very short life, right? But for example, the the first thing to fail on your car when you go on a trip, the very first thing that's going to fail on your car fail is the gas. Mm, you're going to yeah, run out right. of gas. Run out of gas. So you, if you're going on a trip with your family, you're planning, you know, gas breaks next to snack and bathroom breaks, and that's how you go on your trip, right? But eventually, you got to you know rotate the tires and change the oil, and so that's how you care for your car. It's the same thing with the parts. If you're doing a PM on a component, a preventive maintenance task on a component, you know, check the bearing, check the belt, you should have that component in the storeroom or at least know where to get it. Why? Because you're looking for it to be in a state of failure or a sign of a failure, a there failure mode. Why wouldn't you already have it? I mean, how many times have you heard, or maybe it might be anecdotal, but uh, I hear a lot of times, hey, we, we've got to replace those belts. Where do we get them? Mm-hmm. They discovered on a PM we need to replace the belts. Where do we get them? That's like the worst time to ask that well, question. Of course. If you're doing a PM on a component, know where to get that component or or stock it if it's one of those that has to be replaced enough. Sure. And I, I'll tell you, Wes, I, I've given so much thought and there's so there's such importance of reliability in the store. And I've done a couple of things. Let me just tell you what those are. Sure. I've reached out to a couple of third party storeroom contractors. These are people that actually run your storeroom for you. Okay. They bring the people in, they run the procurement, they do all the stuff. And so I've got a couple of third party uh, storerooms that I do a little bit of consulting with. And here's my message to them. Look, you're, you're always going to be brought in through the procurement side. We need to save money. We need to cut costs in the storeroom. Right. But that's That smells of procurement, right? So you're brought in because procurement says, I think you guys can help us because you can 
buy things cheaper than we can. And, and plus, you guys will take a variable cost of labor and make it a fixed cost with your own staffing. I said, so procurement brings a third-party contractor, storm contractor in, but what keeps them there for years on years is service and convenience. That's right. If you get into where you're talking meantime between failure, meantime repair, and you're aiding the maintenance department in preventive predictive planning and scheduling, and you're an asset over on the reliability side, you will stay there because you'll have this great partnership. Yes. The it's, th- it's the vision alignment. It's getting everyone on the same page. Yeah. Right? Or, or otherwise, it's always about the cost, right? And somebody's yep. always going to, a, a younger gun's going to come along and undercut you, right? Yep. And Wes, you know this personally that I've, I've also involved in a storm certification program, mm-hmm. and it's a public class, but it's also part of a certification program. So the public class itself is three days long, but there's a fourth day option for the people that want to stay for the fourth day. And that fourth day is nothing but reliability. And I and I go, so there's a regular traditional storeroom stuff that you sure. get. But the fourth day is calculating reliability and exercises how the storeroom can improve the reliability number. You're going through the reliability sure. metrics and how the storeroom is relevant. Because if you can't, as a storeroom manager or someone that's in charge of the storm, if you can't explain the relevance and the importance and how you make income for the company, you're there seen you as an expense or worse, a liability. There you go. And if you're seen by the organization as a liability, you're not going to be promoted and you know, songs written about you and add to your staff and give you more space, they're going to find a way to cut you. No, absolutely. And I I like that idea, right, of the the storeroom people having a a section or, you know, at least some level of education and reliability. Because unfortunately, we you talked about, you know, leadership in the trades. I mean, we get into certain levels of maintenance and reliability. And some people don't have just the, the fundamental understanding of maybe what reliability is. We see it all the time in lubrication. That someone that has maybe never picked up a grease gun is tasked with, you know, managing the the lubrication program. Mm-hmm. Well, what better way than training? And of course, certification, you know, is is kind of that uh, mark of competency of saying yes. You know, they not only did they take the the class, but they also learned and was able to apply some of this. So I I, I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, how can I actually hold you to an expectation if I haven't trained you? That's right. And in a professional setting, Wes, we're going to sit down and say, look, I'm going to send you to this class or you're going to watch this video or, or whatever the mode of infer, you know, education is. But I, I want you to be more capable when you come out of that. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't just take you can't just take a person off the street and expect them to be a you know, world class tribologist. Right. Uh, They've yeah, got to have some right. training. Yep. And, and by the way, let me just say that the trainee has to show some interest well, and some sure. gumption, too. You can't take yeah. a dish rag. And they're in training to be a you know master mechanic, but we, the 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 storm has to be seen as a core value driver to reliability. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's exactly what a lot of maybe people listening here. The storm is just a collection of parts that we mismanage. Yeah. It's in a room. It's got dust under it. I mean, even look at it and ask yourself: Is this a real viable part of this business? And and the image I always set for the people that are in my class, and the one I want your listeners to take. When you walk into a storeroom, and I don't want to get brand specific, but when you walk into a, a, a professional storeroom, it ought to look like any of the auto parts stores, you know, the O'Reilly's and Pet Boys. Yeah. It ought to be well lit, well stocked, sure. everything faced and cleaned off. The stuff that we want you to monkey around with, you know, the nuts and the bolts and stuff is out front. But if you want a real car part, you come to the counter. That's right. You might have stand in line, right? But when you get up to the sort of the service person, they're going to say, what can I help you with? You're going to hold up a part or you're going to say, I got a 2010 Ford Escape. You're going to articulate what it is you need or actually have the part in your hand. As the requester, you have a responsibility to say, here's what I have. What can you do? The person at that, I I guarantee you, the person at that auto parts store is going to get on their computer. Yep. There's a hand. They're They're clickety clackety. They're going to go, I'll be right back. They're going to go get something. Now, contrary to my inherent reliability, they can may come back with an aftermarket, you know, you know cars are. Uh, sure. Uh, but they're going to have something. Or they're going to do this. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we don't have one, but uh, I can get one up from Oklahoma City this afternoon if you'd like to come back or we can mail it to you for free, mm-hmm. service and convenience. Or on the computer, we don't have one. Let me check. Oh, no, we don't have But we can get one up from Dallas in a couple of days, can we mail it to you for free or would you like to come in? Now, see, that is service and convenience. That's right. If your storeroom does not look like that and perform like that, then you're, you're, it's not the best it can be. I'm not sure. saying that what you're doing is wrong. I never tell any clients what you're doing is wrong. You're obviously making money and you, you guys are effective. But ask yourself, storeroom, 
are you doing it the best way in the world? And mm-hmm. if you're honest, your answer is one of two things. The answer, if you're being honest, the answer is no. Well, or of course. how would we know? Yeah. And then I'd say, well, let me show you something, right? And then we talk about it. And then the benefit has to be there, right? To make cost you a million dollars to be the best in the world. That's a financial decision. A Do we decision. need to go that way, yeah, that yeah. far into it? Or what level? It's, it's it's the whole kind of Pareto principle, right? It's the whole 80-20. You know, what gets us far enough along to, you know, be satisfactory? Yeah. Look, here's what we're fighting. It boils it down to. This century, we're in the 21st century, we're fighting the same battles we fought last century when I went to high school and the Wright brothers invented flight. Here's what they are. Maintenance never fixes anything. Production breaks everything. And the storeroom never has anything. Yeah. We're absolutely in control of that third one. The sure. storeroom never has anything. The maintenance department tells the storeroom what to stock in and what quantities and what to get rid of. The person in the maintenance department that actually does that is the planner. And that's the... Uh, best scenario, and that's the way you set it up. Maintenance tells storm what to stock, and storm knocks themselves out to stock that in those quantities. And that word comes from the liaison, which is the planner. The planner. Yeah. Well, John, I'm, I'm getting the signal that we're running low on time here. Already. But I, I, I agree. But I want to give you the the last word here. I mean, if if you had you know final thoughts that you wanted to make sure that the the listeners, the viewers, walked away from this with, what would you tell them? Well, I'd like them to have this visual. There's 10 primary maintenance processes, identify, approve, prioritize, all the way to planning and scheduling execution. There's 10. There's 32 storeroom processes. The maintenance department and the storeroom, regardless who owns the storeroom, procurement, third party, or maintenance, they're connected at the process of kitting. That's where those two organizations touch each other. World-class companies have figured out how to kit parts in advance. It increases the utilization of your workforce. The part has to be there to maintain the inherent reliability, and the storm has to maintain the inherent reliability of the part. There you That'd go. be my final message, I guess. I, I think that's great, and I think kitting is a great way to go about it. Oh, yeah, it. absolutely. All right. Well, John, I very much appreciate you you coming by. Uh, I'd love for you to come back because I know there's a lot more that I want to pick your brain about. But uh, for those of you that are viewing and listening, thank you so much for for joining Gear Talk. Uh, Please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or even suggestions on topics that you'd like us to address in the future, you can always email us at podcast at noria.com. Thanks. 